Okay, hey, great to see everybody. I haven't spoken here, I think the last time was probably a year ago, actually. Uh, not at this location, but at uh, out of PG, uh, uh, New York Postgres event. Uh, I did get a chance to speak in New York at uh, the PG Day. How many of you got a chance to go to the New York PG Day at uh, 59th Street? Is that what it is? Okay, good. Uh, it was a great event, um, kind of a lot of craziness in terms of going from Austin to Washington to, to New York, but uh, it was a great time. We have um, we have PGCon coming up next week, so up in Ottawa, how many people are going to PGCon? Okay, I'm seeing guys, thank you. Um, PGCon is basically the sort of back-end hackers event, so pretty much all the back-end engineers uh, will be attending PGCon. It's just kind of the place we all go. We had to get to meet Tom Lane. That's his, his one outing for the year, lucky guy. Um, someday I guess I'm going to be able to do that. But no, I really do enjoy coming out. So, um, it is really good. In fact, I got beaten up because somebody asked on the list, um, you know, the slides would be available. And of course, helpful person that I am, I'm like, oh yeah, here's the web address, and we have a recording, and organizers are like, don't do that, don't do that before the event. But anyway, the slides themselves are not really super fantastic. Not that I'm super fantastic, but I think my talking with the slides is better than uh, just looking at slides. Um, the slides actually are at this web address right here, so if you ever want to look at the slides, um, there's over 30 presentations at that URL. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is database hardware selection guidelines. It's kind of a mouthful. But what really prompted me to write this presentation um, was because uh, as a consultant and a trainer and obviously somebody who is on the list a lot, uh, we get a lot of people coming to us asking for harder recommendations. And historically, we had a tendency to get, I don't want to say, I don't want to say ignorant people, but people who didn't really understand a lot of the complexities that we deal with uh, as people who work with databases day in and day out. They knew their hardware, but they didn't really understand how some of the hardware selections for databases are significantly different than hardware selections for a web server or you know, a normal application server. Um, so having kind of lived year after year with people really not understanding that, uh, I figured, hey, let me, let me kind of write a presentation about that particular topic. Um, and, and, uh, uh, that's how this presentation kind of came to be. Uh, any questions before we get started? Um, anything in general? Anything for the, the New York organizers? Or um, what's our next event, Jim or, or Jonathan? Um, to I be determined in June. What's this? To be determined in June. Okay. Well, we, have a good, uh, we have a good idea of what it is. We just got five minutes to speak. Great, great. I'm sure it'll be good. Thanks. So uh, let's get into the let's get into this actual talk. Um, this is normally what people are thinking about uh, when they're sort of specking out their hardware or sending a list to us as engineers and say, hey, you know, what type of selection should I do and how fast should everything be? And, and, and really, we have to kind of tell them over and over again, stop looking at these things. <laughs> right? um, we we have to kind of tell them. Uh, not to fall into the trap of sort of thinking things about a server just like they would. They have to fall, not fall into the trap of thinking like a data, thinking about a database server the same way they would think about a normal server. This is normally the way people think about their servers. Um, CPU is the big thing, you know, and all the fancy graphs it produces, right? I mean, uh, I have a 16 core machine at home, and you know, it does all the fancy little bar charts. I can see how many CPUs are being used, and all that other stuff. But um, that really is not how we need to think about a database server. And um, that is really, I think, the crux of this talk. The way you should think about a database server is this way. And uh, I'm going to go into the reasons for that, but basically, the the problem is that databases have such a different workload than an ordinary server that thinking about your database server this way 
has a tendency for you to allocate resources in an, a non-optimal manner. In English, you're spending a lot of money at the top end, okay, and you're, very, you're not spending anywhere near enough money at the bottom, the middle and bottom ends. Um, allocating the resources properly, which is what most experienced database people do, gives you a server that is running really well, uh, you're getting huge amounts of throughput, uh, you're able to sleep at night, the machine can handle loads that you wouldn't think were possible. Uh, allocating it improperly, uh, again, is going to kind of give you headaches. Uh, not initially, but as you try and scale that machine up, uh, you're going to kind of be kicking yourself and saying, wow, you know, if I expect that this way, I would have such a better server. And again, the goal of this presentation is that you don't spend time doing this and you go right, basically, to uh, the right answer. So um, why is a database server different? What is it different about um, a database server that means we have to think of it this way? Well, uh, a traditional server, this is a non-database server, really is doing things like network traffic, network uh, load, text processing, uh, virtual machines, which obviously have their own uh, overhead, uh, application code, right? Uh, these are all things that are very CPU bound. Okay, so the idea of thinking of CPU is not wrong, it's just not really a great thing when you're talking about databases, because databases really don't do these things very much. Yeah, if there's a network overhead, and yeah, there's some text processing, but again, 99% of your activity is not involved in that. For a database server, most of your, of your activity is involved in these act, these things. Uh, and as you might imagine, they're really not very, very dependent on the speed of the CPU. So things like sequential scans of large tables, right? Uh, do we really do that when we read email? Well, you can have some big emails, but in general, you don't do that. Um, uh, a lot of random I.O., you know, reading sort of randomly around an index, not something you do a whole lot in, in a, in a non-database application. Uh, unpredictable career requirements and reporting, again, really not something you do as a major job uh, in, a, in a normal uh, server. Uh, these are not CPU intensive uh, tasks, and that's again why that pyramid looks so different for a database server versus a traditional server. Um, so, uh, this, present, this slide here, I think, uh, is really, oh, actually, let me stop. Any questions so far? I'll take that as good. Okay. So this slide is what I would think of as a Rosetta Stone of understanding how Postgres does what it does internally. Um, this, if you see, how many of you have seen this slide before? Oh, hey, great. Got a bunch of guys. Okay. So I hope I don't bore you again by explaining it. But again, to understand this slide is really to understand a lot of the performance trade-offs. Uh, that Postgres basically handles. And fortunately, it pretty much has everything kind of all bundled into one kind of nifty slide. Um, the slide is basically broken up into two parts. Uh, there's the part on the left here, which basically is involved in uh, query processing and checkpoints. And then there's the part on the right, and I'm going to try and stand over here to give myself a little movement. Uh, there's the part here on the right, which basically uh, deals with transaction durability. Okay, let's look at those two parts kind of separately. So the part on the left, uh, effectively we have, we have three layers here. We have the, uh, the shared buffer cache, which is where we do all of our I.O. So all the reads and writes actually happen in that red area. And then underneath that we have the kernel buffer cache, and then beneath that we have the disk blocks. Okay, so that's pretty traditional. Again, you're reading and writing here, and then occasionally you're doing a checkpoint, and they're getting flushed down to the disk. The second area over here, which I think really is involved in hardware selection, is something called transaction durability. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you really realize that transactions have a durability requirement, meaning if we commit a transaction and we pull the plug and we plug it back in, we, we have to assume that that transaction is durably stored. You can't lose a transaction. So very similar to like, well, I mean, actually not similar. If you have like a spreadsheet, you save it. And then the server crashes a second later. Well, is your spreadsheet there or not? I don't know, right? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. With a database, you don't have that luxury. Basically, every time 
if you make a change to the shared buffer cache, you also have to write something good to the Mary called the Whitehead log. And that Whitehead log has to be not only written to the kernel, but written to some kind of durable storage. Okay, and you can start to see where you start to get to really significant throttling here. Um, because not only are you sort of throttled by the speed of RAM, which is pretty darn fast, but you, you start to get throttled by the actual disk and the head going around and a little arm moving. Uh, all of a sudden, you're now talking about some real slowdown uh, in the system. And fortunately, there are some hardware selection things you can do to, 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 to minimize that. But again, you often have to do that when you're specking the hardware out. It's kind of hard to do you know, a year down the road. Yeah, you can do it, but it's much harder to do it that way. Okay? So again, two parts, the shared buffer cache part, the checkpoint part, and then on the right is that transaction growing ability part, and that's really the part uh, that, that has a lot to do with hardware selection. So let's take a look at, at a different slide. It's sort of like this slide, but what we've done is we've kind of broken it apart. We've taken the area between the kernel uh, the kernel disk cache and the disk blocks, and we basically opened it up. And we've actually shown some additional letters that are kind of in the stack that you may or may not have thought of um, over time. So what we basically did, we have the same shared buffer cache, the same right ahead log, okay? And then we have the same kernel buffer cache here, but then we've added <coughs> two new areas here, okay? And pretty much every modern system has this kind of thing. One is the basically the RAID cache uh, or the HPA cache on the space adapter. It's basically your, your disk controller, your storage controller. Um, and then underneath that, we have actually some cache on the disk drives itself. So I'm not sure how many of you are aware of that, but every modern disk drive has some kind of cache on the drive to basically speed up reads and writes. Okay. So I've basically kind of broken it out. And the reason I've broken it out is this F-Sync thing. Because F-Sync, as I said before about pulling the plug out, F-Sync has this requirement that when you write a transaction and you basically flush it down to permanent storage, all of a sudden these layers become really important. Because although you can cut, you know, you don't really think about how much RAM you have, how much cache you have on your drive or your RAID control. It's not really something you think about. But um, where it becomes important is when we have to guarantee durability. All right. Um, so I actually have two displays here, uh, kind of highlighting. One is called a write back cache, and one is called a write through cache. And I just want to kind of go over those terms a little bit. Um, a write-back cache is one where when the, cat, when the data reaches the cache, the cache acknowledges the write immediately without passing it down to any lower layer. <coughs> and a write-through cache is one where it, when a write comes to the cache layer, it writes it through to the lower layer beneath and it waits for a response to come back. Okay? So I know it sounds pretty academic why these are important, but the next slides kind of kind of kind of bring that forward. Okay? So we okay with this so far? Great. Okay. So this is the first case where we start to see some real performance improvement based on hardware selection. Okay. What we have now on the third layer, basically the HBA or the RAID cache layer, uh, is a battery. You know, it sounds really stupid. It's like, well, I got a battery in my, you know, in my microphone here, right? Um, is that really significant to databases? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, and the batteries don't actually look like that, but they kind of look close, so I, I, have to, I have to admit. Um, so what is that battery doing there? Why is it important? How many of you have ever heard of batteries that sit on caches? Is that familiar? Okay, we've got a couple people. Again, this is, again, I'm, I'm sort of here to show you how important that is. Not, not necessarily important for your web server, right? But it's really important for your database. And let me explain why. Because because as we get farther down in the layers, uh, particularly here, this is really slow. Okay? Because, for example, if you have like the fastest drive, so you have like a magnetic drive, I'm sorry. So you have a magnetic platter, it's spinning at 15,000 RPM. Anybody, how many commits can you, how many times can you write to that atomically in a second? 15,000 RPM in a second. <coughs> like 250, 
Okay, that's pathetic. Because you've got you've got a CP running at the gigahertz speeds, right? But now if we have to write something all the way down to here, we're now really limited to 250 right right ahead log flushes a second. That's 250 commits a second. If you've ever like gone on a real production server that does it, that actually has to write for this, and you start doing a lot of writes, and you can actually look at the chart and it goes and it hits 250 and it just goes like this. Because everything is now throttled, waiting for the data to get all the way down to here. Right? So how do we fix that? Well, one way we fix it is actually to have a cache at the controller card. And what that does is that when we issue an F-sync up here, and the F-sync says pass to the kernel, and the kernel passes it down to the HBA, the HBA, because it has normal storage, can basically reply right away and say, I've written that data, that data is currently stored, you can keep going. Because again, the requirement of durability by default for Postgres is that every time you write something, it's going to stay written, and we're not going to acknowledge it until we're sure it's written. Right. So, what this battery is basically doing is it's making it so we now, instead of now being, instead of being throttled at 250 commits a second, we're now up at 5,000 commits a second, or 7,000 commits a second. Okay? It's not, it's not, it's not a 10 percent improvement. It's like 100 times improvement, basically, uh, that you can get for a right load, right heavy load that has to have full durability requirements. So you, you can relax it. You can turn synchronous commit off, okay? And you can basically say, I'm willing to lose a couple transactions in case of a failure. If you've got hardware that doesn't have this battery and you somehow basically say, you know, I'm willing to lose a couple transactions, your, your, your simplest thing without getting that battery is basically to turn synchronous commit off, which means you might lose, you know, 200, 300 milliseconds of your commits in the case of a power failure and operating system crash. That might be fun. It might not be fun. Right? What the cool thing about this is, is that that battery probably costs $300. All right? Am I willing to go? Is it worth going from 250 commits a second to 5,000 or 7,000 for 300 bucks? Yeah, you bet it is. Because I spent 300 bucks just getting a little faster CPU. And I'm wasting that because I'm throttled down here at 250 commits a second. My CPU's doing squat. But the real takeaway, I don't know how many of you do performance stuff or stuff with your service. How many people have a slow server where the CPUs are completely doing nothing? Maybe nobody wants to tell me. But you do, you do see it, right? You look at your server, it's not performing the way you want it to, and my CPUs are completely idle. Why are they idle? Because they're all they're basically choked. They're choked because you don't have enough I.O. channel, or you don't have enough memory to basically hold your working set. And th those layers at the bottom are just like working like crazy, and CPUs are just twiddling their thumbs. Right? Where what we really want is we want the CPUs to be busy. But the CPUs are only going to be busy when we've got an I.O. subsystem that really <coughs> is, is providing enough data so we don't, so that CPU doesn't have to wait for these things to happen. Okay? So that's just one example of basically a simple purchase that gets you a real, uh, a real payback. Uh, another example, uh, how many of you are using, uh, how many of you are using like SSDs in your server now? Ah, only a couple? <coughs> ah, okay. Um, so I, I guess I'm, this is something new maybe, that's it. Uh, a lot of database people thought, all right, you know, SSDs, these things are great. They have good random, random, random I.O. performance. This is going to be night and day for my server. Well, maybe, maybe not. Why is that? Well, a couple things. First, um, a lot of the SSDs that you purchase uh, that were available up until about nine months or 18 months ago, basically um, did not have a battery on the SSD. Now, you might think, well, why do I need a battery on the SSD, right? It's, it's, it's non-volatile storage, it's NAND, 
right? It's flash, whatever, effectively, right? Why would I need a battery on a drive that's got a flash on it? I've I got a USB stick here, I don't have a battery on it. Well, what they don't tell you <laughs> is that SSDs don't like small writes. SSDs effectively really want to write data in about 256K chunks. All right, so it's not like RAM that you just randomly write all over the place. And the performance characteristic for that write is pretty much the same no matter how much data you write or where you write it. That's, that's random access, right? With Flash, it really doesn't work that way. It basically wants to clear out an area and it wants to write kind of a whole thing. So, the SSD manufacturer's like, well, you know, we can't, it isn't RAM, it doesn't behave like RAM. How do we actually get this to work? Well, we're going to have a staging area on the drive. So when you write to the drive, your data is going to sit there waiting to be written. And then once we get enough data, then we're going to finally write it to the, to the flash, to the permanent. And you might think, well, OK, I guess that's OK. Well, it might be OK for a lot of servers, but it's not OK for a database server. Why? It gets back to that write back cache issue. If I have a staging area on my drive, and there's no battery, OK? then when I write to the staging area, I really shouldn't be acknowledging the write until it gets on the flash. But if I wait for the data to get down to the flash, it could be seconds for that data to get there. So I'm going to have to acknowledge it real fast. Well, OK, so you acknowledged it. That's fine. But the problem is if you lose power, that flash cache goes away. Because this is traditional RAM. This is not made of flash. It's just traditional RAM that loses its data when you turn it off, OK? So the takeaway here is you might think, oh, I got an SSD. I don't need a cache up here. But you still do, because you might have lower layers that, in fact, have not have volatile caching underneath, underneath them. And therefore, we actually have to have still a battery up in that, in that controller card area, OK? So what I'm saying is, just because you have an SSD does not mean that you don't need a battery, um, either on the SSD or on the RAID controller. Okay. Uh, when I spec'd out my server, I ended up not getting a battery here, but I got an SSD that had a battery on it, and I'll be talking about the particular model that I got in a later slide. Okay. So my point is, you need a battery probably one place or the other. Uh, to get the kind of performance and reliability that you want. You can get great performance without the battery, but again, you don't want to be corrupting your database when you lose power, and, and, and nobody really wants that. And again, it's not that much money, you know, when you spec out a server to do it right. Any questions? Yes, sir? How, do these, uh, how does your um, infrastructure become aware of the battery? Okay, so the question is, and I will be repeating the questions, not because I always do, because some people can hear it, and also because they're recording. So, um, so the question is, how does the infrastructure know about the battery? Um, two, two ways. So um, the, the car, the firmware on the car actually knows that the battery is present. It even knows that the battery is charged. So for example, if the battery becomes unusable for whatever reason. It just ages. The firmware on the card actually realizes the battery is unusable and then will automatically, um, it will automatically stop going in write back mode. It'll sort of go, go, go to write through mode. Okay? So the system, the, the firmware on the good cards actually will go from write back to write through as soon as that battery is no good. Okay? Now, in terms of the lower layers, how does it know the lower layers have battery? Basically, usually what happens is when the HBA has a battery and it goes into write back mode, it will force these lower layers into write through mode. Or at least into a mode where it says, I am, I am now requiring that when I send something to you that it is on durable storage. So the, uh, basically, the way that the SATA 2 and the SAS specifications are, you actually basically send a message down and say, 
you know, go into right back and go right back to the middle. Um, you may, however, you might, now I, I don't, I, that's a, this is something I'm actually not sure of. If you have a battery up here, so you're in right back <coughs> mode, and this is already here on the SSD, you might need to go into the firmware of the H, HPA and turn off the right, you, you might have to turn off the HPA from forcing the drive in the right through mode because we don't need right through mode because it's got a battery. Okay? So the, the bad news is in a lot of cases, you because I guess databases aren't that common and this is new technology, other you have to like look. Like, you know, basically, oh, I know I have a, a drive, I know it has a battery, so now I need to go into my firmware of my SSD, or firmware of my rate controller and say, don't force my don't force my drive into write through mode because it has a battery. Because by default, it will actually force it into write through mode using the, the SCSI or the SATA specification. Um, so the bottom line is you really have to know. Um, even worse, it's like the, the mantra for this thing is that unless you physically see the battery, or unless the, the vendor specifically talks about a battery backing up the staging area of the SSD, you should assume it is not there. So you should assume that, that drive, by default, will lose your data if you lose power. <coughs> just, just unless, and, and, and again, this is kind of a, it's sort of like the, the drive vendors got into SSDs and oh, this is going to be great, and the database people are saying, hey, 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 hold on, this is not durable, this is, you know, because normally, Normally what will happen is the HPA will always communicate to the drive controller and it will tell the drive controller, we want this cache to be right through. So you can control the devices it communicates with. And it can say, I only want right through for these devices. Don't use right back on the cache you have. The problem is on a magnetic drive, there's really no hardware reason why you can't go into right through mode. Because again, you're your cache is just going to slow down, but you don't care because you're no longer throttled by that, those magnetic disks anymore. So you don't care if it, if it goes into right through mode or not. With an SSD, if you, if you run it in right through mode, you will wear that SSD out much quicker because the SSD is now churning that flash memory a lot more than it would if it was in right back mode. And that is sort of a, just a, an effect of flash. Um, so a lot of people who are doing this type of stuff almost have to become experts, have to get the spec sheets out, have to talk to Seagate or Fusion IO or you know, all the other vendors out there and read those spec sheets and look specifically for how, do you, how is that cache handled, is that cache durable or not. We've even seen cases where the, where the, where the controller card tells them to turn off the cache and the drive will not turn off the cache. Probably because the flash itself will wear out quicker, so it just ignores it. Now, those are other drives, but the bottom line is this is a very scary area. And it's really not well defined at this point, I think, in general. Um, and I will talk about some, the, some particular models that are very good. That we're basically telling everybody to stick with those models because it is just, just such a volatile area, unless you're really going to call the vendor up and you know, get an answer from them or really dig into those spec sheets, you shouldn't assume anything. It's kind of impressive. Yes, sorry. You answered my question. Great. Other question? I got all three questions at once. Great. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So that's Flash. What about DRAM? Now you don't hear a lot about DRAM drive, but this is um, typically your Fusion I.O. drive. Anybody use Fusion I.O. stuff? Okay, they're, they're really expensive, so it's not, not surprising. Uh, Fusion I.O. drives are basically DRAM. Uh, they're not flash. Uh, obviously, I think the numbers we get out of these things are like 10x or 100x SSD. Really like screamingly fast. Uh, also screamingly expensive. Um, but all, uh, all of the, all of the uh, DRAM storage de devices actually have a battery on them. They have to because DRAM, you know, we go away. So and again, obviously in this case, the battery is not that useful. 
you've already got really guaranteed status tools down there. Okay. So let's get into some uh, some of the details. Um, actually, let me do this. Oh, look at that. No, I don't want to do that. Um, so this is just kind of going through right back versus right through. Again, this presentation is made for you to look at it later, so there's a lot of text on here. I'm not going to read it. Uh, but again, I want to highlight some things. Um, the different caching layers that we have, basically, um, we have at the HPA level, we have at the storage drive, drive level as well. Um, and, and again, some of the, what's really also confusing, to get back to the question the gentleman had, some drives default to write through and some of them default to write back. So for example, most SAS drives are write through cache and most SAS drives, are, no, take that back. Most SATA drives are right back uh, cache set of default. <coughs> Most SAS drives being enterprise are right through uh, default. Um, if you see performance numbers for different drives and you see the SAS drive is slower than the SATA drive, that's probably because the SAS drive is right through and it's going to force the, the data to the disk until it, 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 it comes back. SATA traditionally being more of a, of a consumer one in the drive normally is not, is not set up that way. And again, it's not that big a deal. If you're using a file server or something, you don't really care that much about durability. Um, but databases do, and again, that's, that was why we got to this talk in the first place, right? Um, HPA is really a great place to do the caching. It covers all of your drives at once. Um, it, it, does, it does have a battery, so it does require uh, some sort of maintenance there. Um, if you're looking to buy magnetic disks, just keep in mind um, a lot of small drives are bigger than a few big drives. So I don't know how many of you sort of work in big enterprises, but I remember we used to buy, this is years ago, we used to buy like, we used to buy drives smaller than the ones that were in the desktops. You know, like, so you'd have, you know, 500 meg drives, this is years ago, you'd have a 500 meg drive in the desktops, and then you'd put, You'd be putting these 100 meg drives in the server, and you're like, well, why are you doing that? Well, we can, we can spread our disk over, you know, we can spread our database over 10 different drives. All of a sudden, we were getting much better throughput. Um, RAID 5.6 is really too slow for database writes. Uh, it requires writing to multiple platters, uh, basically for every write. Just kind of don't do that. RAID 10 is really what we see uh, most people using for databases. Um, SCSI versus SATA, again, uh, here's an Intel presentation that kind of goes over some of the details about um, how enterprise drives are a little different. But again, most of the enterprise drives are really doing things uh, that expect 24 hour operation, uh, reporting, um, you know, heat, vibration, you have 20 drives in one enclosure all shaking at the same time. Uh, you normally see uh, the enterprise drive is doing a little better job of that, but again, it's not it's not super conclusive. But in general, uh, in general, the, the SAS drives are basically designed for reliability. The SATA are normally designed for hitting a price point, but there are SATA enterprise drives, right? Um, so don't don't feel that it's always that way. Uh, SSDs. Um, Again, DRAM is really expensive. Uh, that staging area is more than cache. So just be careful what you do there. Um, you can, if you go into write through mode on an SSD, that SSD can become unusable much quicker uh, than if you can keep that cache enabled. Uh, our normal recommendation from the Postgres group at this point are the Intel 320 series SSDs. Uh, the earlier drives, um, from Intel and from a lot of other vendors had uh, some significant problems. The SSD, even the Intel 320 has not been immune to firmware bugs, if any of you have been tracking that. Uh, but that kind of went away in the middle of last year. We haven't seen any future problems with it. Uh, a lot of the early SSDs just basically had no battery on that fur on that cache, that write cache. And it was causing you know potential database corruption. Um, so the, SS, the Intel 320 was really, I would say, the first drive that was affordable for us, for, for normal database users. I think I have a, at home I think I have a 
160 gig 320 SSD, I think it was $300 or something like that. Really not, not a huge amount of money. Um, there is a new 700 series, 720, 740 Intel, uh, which is a SAS drive, I believe, and is actually designed more for enterprises. Uh, it is twice the price. So, again, you know, uh, you can go either way with it. Um, but what's really exciting for me is that some of this new technology, particularly the battery back cache and some of these SSDs with their batteries, uh, are really helping to eliminate an age-old problem, problem I've been dealing with and all the Postgres users have been dealing with and all the database users, frankly, have been dealing with for, you know, 20 years. And that is, how do you get some data to some durable storage really fast? Um, the platters, the magnetic platters, really were never a great solution for that. Um, these batteries, uh, either on the drives or on the, on the uh, RAID controllers, are really changing that entire equation and are allowing database servers to scale into zones that normally would not be possible before. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are using um, uh, network attached storage devices. Uh, these normally have that same type of durable cache basically built into the device instead of added by you basically at the controller card level. Okay. Um, file system options, we prefer XFS EXT4 um, over EXT3. Uh, there are some issues with F-Sync on FEXT3 that uh, really do throw out performance. Um, a lot of people uh, have moved their XLOG directory over to another location. Again, that allows you to kind of sync, like sort of separate out that very heavy load transaction log commit tra traffic from the general traffic that basically uh, is your data directory. Um, Battery backed uh, cache, I actually, the term that you see a lot is something called BBU or battery backed unit. I don't know why they mean it like that. Um, this is either a battery or a, something called a supercapacitor. I keep, keep wanting to call it the super duper capacitor or something, but um, I don't know why they call it that. Uh, but normally you want to look at it. Um, if you've got a battery, that battery sometimes will only hold your, your data for about 72 hours. So um, just be aware when you lose power, get it back um, or do something because because you could potentially lose data. Some of the newer uh, devices are really nice. When you lose power, the battery basically writes the cache into a flash area and then it can shut down and then you can stay that way forever basically. Okay, so that's sort of the, some of the newer technology to eliminate the, the, the typical 48 hour or 72 hour limit uh, on how long that machine can be without power. Uh, again, as I said earlier, when you lose power on the supercapacitor, the battery, particularly the battery, supercapacitors don't fail that much, but batteries do, um, you'll actually, the system will, all, will go right, um, will disable right back mode. Uh, so the classic case, somebody's running the server two, three years, all of a sudden they get a call, um, you know, performance is terrible. What happened? You know, and you're looking at this machine and you're like, I don't know, it's fine to me. And you start to look at, at your kernel messages and you start to look at the RAID controller. And then you start to see the alerts that come up. So a lot of people, at least in the old days, would actually have batteries on site so that they could get them back in immediately because waiting for that ship to become all well, everyone's screaming at you is not a um, but again, you have to do some failure monitoring and, and you don't require a replacement. Uh, this is actually a picture of a, of a, a DATTEC uh, controller card. Again, there's the, uh, uh, the, the, the pins up there at the top. Um, so uh, that looks like a PCIe, I guess, or X, I can't tell. Um, this is actually a battery, uh, very, very unglamorous, I think. <laughs> It basically said it's a lithium fire <coughs> battery right here. Uh, I think it's basically just some like triple A's or triple A's kind of packaged together in a little plastic thing. And then they got a little wire coming over here and it basically jumpers right in there. And I suppose this is the little a warning thing that tells you the battery's dead. It's a very, very super high tech. Uh, but it, it does it doesn't do the job. 
Um, network attack storage, uh, we, uh, I talked about this a little bit. Basically, network attack storage, uh, obviously designed by people who deal with this kind of thing every day. They're basically internally a bunch of drives, you know, fairly uh, often with different speeds. So they'll have some very fast SSDs, they'll have some magnetic drives, and then we'll also have some type of caching layer with some type of battery backup for that caching layer. Um, and again, it's basically allowing you to have all the stuff you would normally put in a properly configured database server in something you purchase and then just go to the network to get. Um, keep in mind that when you're using network attached storage, you're basically sharing storage, you're sharing. So anytime you're sharing, there's always the potential for bottlenecks, right? So there's nothing the matter with using network attached storage. It works just fine. It's got the it's got the cache in there, it's got the battery on the cache. You're going to get great performance, but just be aware that you are going to be sharing that resource and you can get cases where you know, you're getting sort of thrall with that. Same problem with uh, what you think with using, uh, with using virtual machines, right? In a virtual machine, you're sharing the I.O. across all the other virtual machines on the same machine, even if you have a direct attack storage, right? Nothing wrong with that, but again, if those if some of those uh, VMs are heavy I.O. users, they could very easily interfere with each other and, and cause uh, delays that you, you wouldn't have gotten if you had put on dedicated hardware. Nothing wrong with it, just, it's just you're obviously sharing and you can get, you can get problems with that. Um, so, um, any questions before I go into RAM? So that's the storage part of the talk. Yes, sir? Uh, what about bus speed for moving stuff from that disk over to the CPU? Um, so, okay, so the question is what about bus speed for sending stuff back and forth? Um, I will tell you that the, the, the general uh, rule of thumb is that people who care about performance are using direct attack storage. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, uh, you know, they, they're probably using SATA 2 drives or something like that. Um, and then, are you worried primarily about the network overhead type of thing or, or the iSCSI case? Or? I, I, we're sort of in the um, picking hardware and, you know, my system admin, my sysadmins are big into network attached storage. And I guess one of the questions is, you know, when you talk about buying server class machines, one of the things is they say, well, you, know, you're, you got much faster buses to move data, you know, from that disk controller to the CPU and back. Yeah, it's not the problem. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. Um, so they've got they've got you basically have two options of getting to your data, right? One is the SATA, SATA two, SATA three specification, right? The second is basically Ethernet. I mean, yeah, you can do fiber, but you know, roughly we're talking about two things. Uh, InfiniBand is possible. Um, normally, uh, with you know, SATA, SATA two, you know, it takes so many of those drives to be running your full throttle to actually saturate the thing that mm -hmm. okay. I'm never really worried about that. Right. Um, where we do see cases is obviously when we're all of a sudden doing everything over the network. If there's other people on that network at the same time we could, you know, kind of bump into each other. Um, normally when we're trying to make the trade-off between, if you're worried more about the trade-off between direct attached storage versus a network attached storage type of system, is that? It's one of the discussions I'm gonna have to have with them, so. Right, so um, we normally, our, our basic, the, the basic thing that I've kind of outlined is, is that the network attached storage setup is great for administration, okay? Because it basically allows administrators to have this one big pool, they only have to back up one big thing, and everyone's going into it, it's got all the cash that it needs, we don't have to worry about whether our batteries died, right? Um, kind of everything's there, and the firmware on the network attached storage is really good, so they're all, they're moving stuff from, Oh, I haven't accessed that file in a while, so let me move it from the SSD to the magnetic disk, and you know, let me move this stuff into the cache. And there's a tremendous amount of cool stuff that goes on there. So, from an administrative standpoint, it's really tough to beat network attached storage. 
right? But the problem that we often get people complaining about is that my network attached storage thing was great until everyone else started using it, right? And then all of a sudden, the, you know, the, the database server is really not in the control of its own environment anymore. And this thing that was really easy to manage now is a pain in the neck because i got to figure out, well, how do I get my data to not like, be delayed because someone else is doing some big job on the same device, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're kind of pulling everything in there. So some of the SSD, some of the network attached storage systems, for example, have the ability to use specific drives within the network text storage enclosure. So you can say, okay, I don't want to now have the drive moving things around. I want X drives in that network text storage kind of dedicated to me. But then you've kind of lost the whole administrative ease part, and you're still shoving everything over the network, which everyone else is using to get into this thing. Um, so I think I would say the network text storage is a fine way to start. And if you find that performance is okay, and you're not bottlenecking the thing, then your administrators are going to be happy because they're going to be like, oh, this is really easy. I just back everything up here. And I know my spec, I know that the size sure is not going to go down. And I've already got backups for it on an off-site. And I now I can I can have 20 servers, and now I just have to worry about backing up this one thing or replicating this one thing somewhere else, and my job's a lot easier, right? If down the road you find that all of a sudden you're not getting enough throughput, then you probably need to go back and say, all right, let's pull the data off this network attached storage, let's put some direct storage in there, um, and, and let's start putting some drives in there that are really designed to do this type of workload. And you know, you're gonna see, you know, two, three X improvement. You may not care right now. Like, you know, I'm talking about performance, but you know, honestly, most I'm sure most most servers are sitting doing nothing. You know, not that they're throttled by the I/O, they're just not doing anything. And that's the majority of systems. I mean, I love to think everyone everyone's pushing the envelope. Well, not really. You know, most people are kind of like muddling along, and oh, you know, if some big spike comes, we're ready. But in general, that machine is not doing a whole lot. And in those environments, I think network type storage makes perfect sense. Um, where it doesn't make sense is where I know that I'm going to be pushing a big load here. I've already gotten kind of the biggest machine I can afford, and I'm still not sure it's going to handle the load. Don't do network debt storage. Like, don't even go there, right? Because all of a sudden, everything becomes more complicated. The latency of getting stuff back and forth there is going to be longer. There's going to be all these weird spikes, and you're not going to be sure if it's your machine or your I.O. or that I.O. from somewhere else, and the whole thing becomes really hard to debug, and you're losing performance that you need. So I always think of that as a trade-off between manageability and performance, and that's not an obvious answer in either way, I think. Thank you. Great. Other question? Good. The answer the question. <laughs> Um, you mentioned separating PGX log from data. Yeah. And if you had two RAID arrays, like a RAID 1 for your OS and a RAID 10 for your data, are you suggesting make, like, potentially moving the PGX log to your RAID 1 array? Um, yeah, okay, so the question is if you've got two RAID arrays and you've got, you've got two RAID arrays and your OS is on a RAID 1 and your baby is on a RAID 10, for example, should I move my X log somewhere else to get it out of the critical path? Um, I think it's really a question of how saturated those I/O channels are. Okay, in the example that you gave me, where the, the X log is on one, well, I'm sorry, the database is on one, and your operating system is on another. Odds are your operating system drive is doing nothing, right? It's just sitting there. I mean, it's probably got everything in cache anyway. It's probably not doing a whole lot in terms of operating system writes. Right? Whereas your database might be going berserk, right? Your RAID 10. So that would be a very logical case to basically take your X log and move it uh, into the into the RAID area that is not moving at all. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan, can I get some water? Somebody, Jimmy, put Jimmy to work. Thanks. Uh, I should have filled it up before I went. Anyway, so. So, 
in a case where you got two ray arrays and one of them is really busy and one of them isn't, obviously you have to move the thing over. The nice thing about the xlog directory is it's tiny. It's like 100 megs. I mean, you know, I often tell people, you know, just go out and buy an Intel 320 SSD for 300 bucks and just, just put that in there, right? And just be done with it. It's got, it, it's got its own cache, right? It's got its own battery on it, right? Um, all of a sudden, I can, I can have sync to that thing like crazy, right? So for, for, for people who are, and that's actually a great case, for people who, are, who really don't have the, the, the non-volatile caching in their existing installs, I basically tell people, forget trying to like move stuff around. Just if you don't have a battery and you don't have non-volatile cache in there, just go out, buy a 320 SSD for a couple hundred bucks, plug it into your SATA too, hopefully you've got one of those base, and just shove it in there, move your X-Log over there, and it's going to be golden. Because mostly the only F-Syncs that are going to throttle performance are rights to that X-Log directory. We issue F-Syncs during checkpoints, but those are asynchronous. They're not in the path of commits. The only case where we're really going to wait for a write, and again, it's, the, it's waiting that really is killing us, is going to be that next log directory. So that would be my recommendation for you. Don't even try and put on another. Just go get a dedicated drive, put that X log on there. It's never going to get bigger than 100 megs, right? You know that because of the way you know, it recycles everything, no matter what, it'll checkpoint if it gets above a certain number of checkpoint segments. So you're gold at that point. Does that answer your question? Yes. Great. Other questions? Okay. Uh, <coughs> just wrapping up here, um, RAM is our second level of, like our middle level, okay, of, uh, of, of basically, um, of basic, uh, of that stack, okay? Uh, once you've got your I.O. settled, the next thing to really focus on is the RAM. Um, buy as much RAM as you can, at least as much, so you can get what we call like five minutes of your working set, five minutes of your normal database churn into RAM. And if you can get that, all of a sudden your CPUs will become your bottleneck, which is really where we want the bottleneck to be, okay? Um, Again, five minutes is really where you want to be. That greatly reduces the amount of stress on your IO subsystem, except for that F-Sync part, which we talked about getting the battery to really take care of that. Okay. Um, so you should always get ECC RAM because uh, it's not that much more expensive. Uh, the more RAM you have, the more possibilities for failures. Um, if your RAM is bad, we cannot help you. <laughs> Right? If you've got faulty RAM, there's nothing magical in any pretty much software system that fixes that. Uh, yeah, we can add checks, and we have checks in there, but we can't check everything. Uh, there's still ways in any system, if that, whole, if that whole hardware stack is, is corrupt or is, is flaky, there's no way to be sure. Um, and that's why the ECC becomes uh, really important. Uh, finally, CPUs, again, we're not at the top of the stack. Um, Postgres does not support parallel query. What that means is that we cannot use mobile CPUs. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. We cannot use mobile CPUs for a single query. I know there are some database systems that can do that. I do think Postgres is going to be moving in this direction. Uh, we do have a developers meeting on Wednesday of next week, and one of the topics I will be sort of bringing up and sharing, and it's on the agenda, is really to start looking at this parallel CPU uh, capability. Um, we've gotten away with that so far because, again, most workloads are throttled by the I.O. subsystem or the secondary the memory, uh, but there are some workloads that do need a lot of CPU, and old CPUs can help there. Um, if you use a lot of server-side functions, yeah, CPU load can be significant. Um, also, again, if, every, if the entire database fits in RAM, so you're, you're basically doing a read-only workload, so you're not F-syncing, and you basically got everything in RAM, all of a sudden it's just the CPU that's throttling you now. So again, um, that's a good thing, right? That's what we want. <laughs> that's what we want. We want to be using the money, the money we put on the CPU. 
Um, yeah, this is kind of a weird slide. Uh, the reason it's there is because a lot of people, when they're approaching hardware, they basically think, okay, it's got a steering wheel, it's got a gas pedal, it's got four doors, it must be the same as this other thing that also has a steering wheel and a gas pedal and four doors. Okay? Um, that's not really true. Uh, it's not true in this case. It's not often true in hardware. The problem is that when you look at the stupid things, you can't tell. Like, I can tell pretty well the difference between these two, even though they have the same interface, right? But a lot of times when you're looking at servers or drives or RAM or all these other things, it really takes a lot of digging. You know, it's, it's sort of buried in very arcane uh, fields. Often I tell people, if you're not sure, find a database vendor that deals with databases and make sure you talk to those people about hardware. Um, if you don't have somebody like that, we have a hardware, we have a performance email list. Post to that hardware performance hardware the email list and tell us what you're thinking of buying and ask for a recommendation. And there's hundreds of people on that list who are all doing the exact same thing. Uh, it's called PSQL perform movements, I think. Um, and they're all there now. But now when you do that, don't just tell us about your CPUs, please. Right? Tell us how much RAM you're going to put in the system. Tell us what type of IO subsystem you have. Because again, if you just tell us about your CPUs, the next question we're going to ask you is, don't worry so much about that. Tell us how much RAM is going in the system. Tell us how much, uh, what type of IO system, subsystem you're going to be using. You know, are you going to be using RAID? Are you going to be using network attached storage? Uh, do you have any battery or non-volatile cache in that system? Uh, these are really the things that are going to be making great for your server. So thank you very much. Um, again, finishing with the slide we want to remember for this. Um, I appreciate the questions. Uh, I'm actually ready to take some more questions, so I'm sure somebody has one back there. Uh, yes, sir. Um, when you see post questions from stuff that's very non acidy uh -huh. essentially um, read all the table slides. Mm -hmm. So what uh, freedom does that give? various uh, choices that you've got over. Okay, so um, basically the question is you're using Postgres and it's a lot of non-acid uh, cases and what optimizations can you make basically for that. So uh, the first question is, is this a, uh, a read-only workload? For example, read-only. Read only. Okay, so it's a read-only workload. Um, a lot of this stuff kind of goes away. Okay, so for read-only workload, uh, you're really not going to be generating right in the mob traffic. Uh, except, no, you're really, you're really not going to, even if you're doing streaming replication, right, there's really nothing happening, there, there's, there's nothing to replicate because you're not doing any data modification uh, transactions. So in that case, um, you really, there, there's two things you have to worry about. One is warm-up time, and second is normal operation. So let's go to warm-up time, okay? So normal time um, is really going to benefit from, obviously, a good I/O subsystem. For some of these large read-only workloads, it can take <clears throat> like an hour or more to get that system kind of up, where it's got everything kind of once in a There are some, some tricks to getting around that. There's a PG warm utility that uh, Robert Haas wrote that you can kind of use to get stuff in. I have some people who just take the data directory and just tar it to get it all, to get the data into the kernel cache. <laughs> okay, uh, I know it sounds crazy, but what happens is that when you're doing a lot of random I.O. on the system, um, you're bouncing around all over the place in the index. And I remember somebody, I think it was from Spotify at New York PG Day, who's basically saying, I just cap my indexes to dev null to get them in using sequential, because if I do it randomly, it'll take hours. That was Yodel. Well, I'm sorry? Yodel. Yodel. That was Yodel, that's fine. That was Yodel, thank you. Thank you very much. So that was Yodel who did that. So um, getting warmed up is, is one of the part. After you're warmed up, it's really just a question of the amount of RAM you have. Um, there's really nothing you're going to do with the ISO subsystem that's going to make any difference. There's nothing at the, at the right ahead log level that's going to make any difference. Um, you're obviously really going to be throttled by just the CPU. Um, 
the good news, I think, frankly, you know, I think, you know, I, honestly, I think every database user would love to have your work with, right? I mean, every database user would love to have just a read-only workload because all of a sudden, you don't really have to worry about a lot of the things that you normally have to worry about. You don't have to worry about batteries very much. You don't have to worry about that whole I.O. subsystem, once your system is warmed up. Um, you just need to get enough RAM in there and, and obviously uh, set it up so that you know, the, pro there are the proper number of chips per CPU channel, per CPU, if that makes any sense to you. I, when I bought my system, I had to do, I had two 5620 CPUs, I think it was, and I had to buy memory in, in multiples of six. <laughs> Who would have guessed that, right? Um, so I ended up getting 24 gigs of RAM because it had to be a multiple of six, uh, because it needed each CPU had three memory channels. And so you could say two CPUs you had to use. So a lot of the, a lot of the stuff with that type of workload is getting somebody who's going to basically help spec out the RAM and make sure that we're getting as much ECC RAM as we can and then do it that way. I think, I think there's not a whole lot. That's a much easier kind of case. Um, and, you, and your CPUs are going to be important, as I said in the slide. When you're read-only, your, your CPUs are really that bottleneck at that point. Uh, the other big thing, uh, just to tease you a little bit, uh, Postgres 9.2, uh, actually I'm working on the release notes for Postgres 9.2 like today. I was on that laptop, so I actually came early and I was typing. So Postgres 9.2, which will probably be out in September, is going to do a much better job with very large servers. So. 32 CPU, 64 core machines, that type of thing. Um, so if you're doing really big iron, big stuff, Postgres 9.2 is going to be like blowing the doors off. Um, we're really excited about that. That's really good in the area that we haven't a whole lot with yet. Um, we, we're good at the small to medium range, but this is really going to take us to the, into the large, large data area that we haven't. Yeah, we've done data warehousing stuff, and we were good up to about 16 cores. But really scaling to 32 or 64 cores is, is, is a, sort of a blow the doors off type of uh, solution that we have coming up. We're really excited about that. Great. Other questions? Yes, sir. You're a hardware now, but as far as when it comes to virtualization and the cloud, what would you recommend there? Sure. Uh, I do have a virtualization talk that I'm working on. It's not done yet. So it is done. It'll be on the website. Um, it basically, um, what's what's kind of interesting about Postgres um, is that because it, you know, it's sort of a, a benefit we got from from being a loosely coupled group. So uh, we don't have a big test farm and all these dedicated servers running all these sort of certified operating systems to test everything. Um, so Postgres has always taken the approach of being very operating system agnostic. And we don't have a tendency to do any real trickery stuff like raw devices or direct I.O. or you know, sort of making very exotic kernel kind of calls, you know, to do something incredible optimization. We have a tendency to pull that optimization into our code and therefore it applies to all operating systems. So the good thing about that is that we actually Postgres actually runs really well in a virtualized environment. Okay, so um, you, you see Postgres being used a lot in virtualization. Um, the types of things we've talked about, that the sort of pyramid, really, really kind of still apply. The, the big, I think the big, um, the big good and bad with virtualization is that obviously we run really well, uh, you know, with very little overhead in terms of running on bare metal. So most of our Postgres infrastructure is running on KVM, and effectively the difference between running Postgres and KVM versus running it in bare metal is not negligible, it's like one or two percent. Okay, um, the, the, that's the good thing. The bad thing is that the virtual machines are very good at sort of segregating CPU and memory. Okay, they're not really great at sort of segmenting I/O. So to the extent that you're trying to do really high performance stuff in the VM, it'll run fine. But when we can't magically make a VM's I/O subsystem do any better than it would on the bare metal that you have, so obviously if you take two two 
If you take two servers that are both really pressing the I.O. subsystem, and you put them all, all of a sudden on the same machine in separate VMs, <laughs> things are not going to be good, right? Because all of a sudden, you now had a system that was really throttled on I.O. now competing for the same I.O. in the same box. And although virtualization does a very good job of kind of getting your CPUs used and moving them around, and oh, I want three CPUs for this VM, and I want this much memory for this VM, that works really great from a management perspective. But the I.O. subsystem, not so good. Um, it, it, it really get back into the same problems that we had with, uh, with network attached storage. So it's no longer dedicated to I.O. anymore, right? And now we're going to queue up behind everyone else who wants to use that I.O. Now, in an ideal world, you're going to get a box that has all the I.O. that you need all the necessary caching and non volatile caching layers underneath it, and then you're going to put your server on that, you know, and then all of a sudden, instead of paying for, you know, 10 different batteries for 10 different servers, we're going to have one battery that's going to cover all our VMs. Um, so from a management standpoint, it works fine. Postgres runs fine with variable overhead. My only point is that, um, is that if you're I.O. bound, you're probably going to get worse. The environment because you're now sharing that I.O. Does that answer your question or no? Anyway, I was actually leading to like a road, right? Like they're creating a Postgres instance for you right now. Right. They redefine it right now. Or, I mean, I've never used a road so much. Okay, so, so let's talk about, I always want to talk about private cloud. So let's talk about public cloud, which would be Heroku, which is which is more of a, of a database as a service case than an actual, it's more of a database as a service case versus hardware as a service, right? Um, software, whatever. Um, infrastructure as a service is the term that they use. Um, so Heroku uh, is basically giving you a database and giving you an API to communicate with it um, for basically launching websites and, you know, uh, Ruby stuff or Python or whatever language you want to use. Um, those, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the problems you get into that I talked about for the private environment, you kind of get into the same problems we talked about in Heroku or in Amazon. Um, they seem to run fine in terms of sort of getting you enough CPU, and you, know, you buy CPU units, and you buy you know, a certain you know, super mega jumbo, you know, the, the Amazon names always kill me when I look at them. Um, uh, but the problem always has been, for everyone I've heard, is basically the I.O. Uh, the uh, ephemeral storage in Amazon is ephemeral, means if the thing goes down, your storage goes away. If you use EBS, elastic box storage, that stuff's very variable, um, to the point where it's virtually unusable from any kind of performance standpoint. And I don't think anybody's choosing Heroku for performance. I mean, it's easy to use, it's good for developers, stuff like that. But, but again, um, I.O. is very expensive. It's very hard to share it. Um, it just seems like it just doesn't share well. It, it just doesn't slice up real well. Um, and, and there just doesn't seem to be a good answer to that. A lot of the people who are doing, you know, people who don't need to worry about performance can use, you know, Amazon or Heroku just fine. Um, the stuff's there, it's being managed for you, it works great, but, but if you're trying to push any kind of performance, don't go there. Just don't even, you just don't pull your hair out. Jim, you had some comments on that. Okay. Yeah. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him after a right, there you go, thank you. What about Microsoft Azure? I'm sorry? Microsoft Azure. Oh, so Microsoft Azure. Um, I, we do run on Windows, so I, I, Yes, it would work. Um, uh, that was used. That would use the Hyper-V uh, software, I guess. Uh, I I don't know that. I, I do know. I do know that, that we did. I, I actually asked this question a couple weeks ago. Most of the, somebody asked about performance on Windows, and my answer was basically that most of the people who worry about performance are probably not using. So I would assume that Microsoft Azure would run just fine, you know, but again, 
the, I would assume that the performance is not going to be, you know, again, I, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Most, a lot of people are pushing very little data in their databases. It's just people who are really worried about getting good throughput, you know, those are the people who really have to kind of, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of shortcuts either with VMs or, or uh, um, you know, uh, network fact storage or these things that make management easier. Um, they do make that easier. They, 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 there is always a performance penalty, and it often does come with the I.O. layer, unfortunately. Yes, sir? I think on your last slide, you said that with a lot of server-side processing, like the CPU becomes more important. So I'm using PostGIS, I'm doing a lot of sort of spatial querying and, and uh, you know, spatial analysis, and I wonder if that ends up being that situation, the CPU becomes more important than Okay, so the question is, is post just one where the CPU is going to be a bigger uh, lock? Yeah, um, what's going to happen is not so much, it's not so much the post just functions, but the, the, I, the comparisons that are necessary for indexing for post just are fairly expensive. Um, you know, B-tree, it's a B-tree. You just bounce around it and you get your row. You end up using a lot of I.O., but not a lot of CPU to get a B-tree, right? But when you're looking at running through some of these uh, GIST or GIN indexes for spatial, then you, you do start to see some serious CPU load. The, the real place where you really see it is something like PLR. Mm -hmm. PLR, which is statistic language. Then you're doing like major statistical analysis in the server-side functions, right? And you're, you're, you're popping out a PDF, right? I mean, that's really the top, I would say, in terms of where you're really using a lot of server-side stuff. Um, but you're going to see it in GIS, not so much the data type itself, but the indexing methods. Uh, we do have some improvements <coughs> coming in 9.2 that improve index build times, improve index lookups, uh, improve the way that the trees are laid out in the GIST indexes particularly. Um, so we're still, we're still looking at that. We're, there's definitely, um, there's definitely a lot more overhead in the index lookups in, in this GIS than there is in the normal in the tree lookup. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you commented a lot about PG. What about other databases? Because most companies just don't use one database. What about the column-based databases and the NoSQL type databases? Yeah, so the question is, how does this, how does what I talk about really relate to other databases? If you might have noticed, the presentation does not have, the, the presentation title does not have the word Postgres in it. Uh, particularly because uh, the types of things that I talk about are really true of almost any ACID compliant database. Now, if you're using a, you know, a NoSQL database or one that doesn't really worry about flushing the disk and, and, and having reliable writes, then yeah, some of the stuff I know doesn't really talk about. What I talked about would apply to Oracle, would apply to DB2, would apply to Microsoft. These, we've had this problem for it, these problems have existed forever. Uh, and only now are we getting hardware that really allows us to get rid of that bottom bottleneck. Um, and trying to push the bottleneck obviously up to where we want it, and that is the CPU layer. Yes? You mentioned that Postgre uh, doesn't really try to uh, use the exotic operating system extensions. That's correct. Uh, so, say it's not using things like uh, people or AIO or Okay, so the question is, do, do Postgres use things like AIO or other exotic operating system stuff? Um, we actually do not, and the reason we do is that at the time we needed this type of capability, uh, the support for different operating systems was so spotty that we really didn't want to implement a solution to just fix the problem of one OS and we support 10 different OSs, right? So although we've if we can't fix the problem generally, then we're going to go to an operating system specific fix. But if we can do it in a general way, then we're basically going to do it in a general way and not sort of rely on the kernel operating system. The one case, for example, that we have used um, is POSIX advise, which allows us to sort of pre-warn the operating system what blocks we're going to need in the future. So Postgres probably for the past three, three releases or three years has had the ability to do prefetching of index blocks um, on every operating system that supports POSIX. So we're, we're continuing to look at cases where we, we can do that. 
Um, but in cases where we can actually fix it ourselves, then we kind of prefer to do that because again, it fixes all the operating systems at one, with one shot. So you would say that you're still holding off on, on things like that uh, in the hopes that maybe there's a kind of standard that actually can work. Well, we're holding off on doing things like that either in hopes of a standard or in hopes, in many cases, where we can fix it at our code level without pushing the problem down the operating system. Okay. All right? So for example, a lot of times we could have probably pushed a bunch of things down the operating system, but then all of a sudden when we start running on a VM, a lot of this stuff doesn't work the way we think it does anymore because all of a sudden a lot of the sort of really fancy tricks that people would use in a VM environment don't work the same way. So when we bring it to our level and fix it at our level versus pushing the problem to the operating system, not only do we fix it for the operating system, but we often guarantee that it will run very well in a virtualized environment. It isn't always true if we rely on the operating system. I know it's kind of tricky, but. And I remember when I was and I think, is it anything like in the, the better FS or butter FS or whatever? Oh, so different, oh, so how do we run our butter FS file systems and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's actually tested it. This will probably be the last question. I don't think anybody's tested it, but um, um, I've seen some reports, but I don't know anybody running production on those file systems. I mean, the, the other crazy thing is just go raw. Just go, Forget the file system, just run it very much The yeah. problem with that, effectively, is that we have become the file system. And therefore, we, we, we basically don't know what else is happening on the drive. We don't have all the information that the kernel has about the type drive and the way the drive is laid out. So we ended, up, we ended up pulling a big problem into our space. And we have to look and say, if we pull a big problem into our space, what are we gaining or what are we losing? Well, we're obviously we're gaining a big amount of code that we've got to write and maintain. And then what are we really gaining by using more devices? And most kernels, most databases are moving away from that because the raw devices effectively, um, although they might give you like 3% benefit, they're so hard to manage that it, you know, they're just sort of frowning at it now. And most of the kernel file systems are pretty good. You know, uh, They're not like the old system five release three operative files that kind of fragment and everything. Um, there's so much good work happening in the file system area as I mentioned. Uh, we don't really feel that we have to like, create our own file system to do what we want to do. Um, could we get a little benefit from it? Yeah, we get a lot of headaches. Yeah. <laughs> and we kind of we just stop there, I think. Jim? Cool. Thanks, Bruce. Great.